Welcome to the Contrarians. Tonight we have yet another episode in our Dark Horse album series. Tonight we're taking a look at the Cars 1980 album Panorama. This is a Patreon member suggested topic. We are going to take a look at this record and dissect it. Is this a true Dark Horse record? So without any further ado, let's get this one started. and tonight is yet another in our dark horse album series tonight we are looking at the band the cars and the album panorama from 1980 we're going to look at this record everyone knows that those first two cars albums in heartbeat city classics you know people can't get enough of those records but what about panorama it came right after Candio. We know Candio is a great record. We were having a little discussion prior to the show taping about uh, the first album in Candio, which was could be a show in itself. But tonight, we are going to take a look at Panorama. Um, when it first came out, the reviews were just kind of, uh, well, people are a little, well, it's not too bad. Mostly three-star reviews as opposed to what the other two albums got. But after all this time, how do we look at this record now? If this was a horse race, we, would we expect Panorama to win the race? I don't know. It might tonight. We've got I've got two guests here tonight. I've got Tate Davis and Matt here, and we are going to take a look at Panorama. Gentlemen, how are you? Welcome to the show. You're ready to talk some cars. I'm always, always ready, ready to talk to cars. Ready. So who's was it? Either one of you got whose topic was it? Was it one of you guys? I don't know. Maybe it's bicycle. I don't know. I voted band. for it, but I don't know who suggested it. I don't know who well, suggested then, the idea. All right. Well, I'm just going to go. Well, I'm going to uh, talk on this one, too, because I love the Cars. In fact, the Cars are one of my favorite bands. I like the whole catalog. I mean, some albums, yeah, I like more than others. But uh, we're all Cars fans on this particular episode. So I'm going to start with Tate. Tate was here first, so I'm just going to go around Tate, Matt, and then me, and I'll finish it off, and we'll uh, give you our opinion on the 1980s panorama. Tate Davis, take it away, sir. And also, before you start, and what I want to do is take your uh, rating out of 10, and then we'll just do an average. So we'll see where this goes. Maybe this album pulls ahead. All right, Tate Davis, take it over. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Um, so Panorama is a uh, very interesting uh, album in the Cars discography because it comes, like Grant had just mentioned before, it comes off the heels of two albums that were both big sellers and are considered by many to be, uh, you know, the greatest like one, two punch of <clears throat> excuse me album releases in you know kind of the late 70s early 80s like new wave era um and uh panorama when i first heard it i was not it, it was not as immediate as the first two were mm -hmm. and um i think this is an issue that the cars have with their post candio um studio outputs is that there's a handful of really great memorable songs on there and then there's some tracks on there that are just kind of you know they're good but after you hear the album you probably have to go listen to those songs again in order to actually remember them in or in other words they're not as immediate immediate there's no truly like there's very few truly like bad songs in my opinion in the cars discography there's just not there's just songs that just aren't as immediate and as memorable as the stuff on the debut and candio but with that being said i am going i'll uh, go ahead and go track by track so panorama opens up with the title track and i think it's a really good way to open up the uh um the album it's synth poppy it's got a really catchy chorus it's panorama panorama you know <laughs> uh you know just a really engaging way to open up the album 
and Elliot Easton has a uh, um has a really good solo at the end. And I and before I go any further with this, um, all the songs on this album, as with all of the uh um a good majority of of the songs in the Cars discography, Elliot Easton and Greg Hawks are like the two MVPs in in my view. Uh, uh, you know, instrumentally, David David Robinson obviously has a great pocket as a drummer, but. Elliot Easton and, and Greg Hawks are always um, putting in great uh, um, parts in, within the song. So with that being said, uh, Touch and Go, which was the uh, one of the singles from this album, is easily my favorite song on the album. It's not even close. Um, there's a polyrhythm during the verse section. Um, the uh, The bass and the drums are in 5-4, and um uh the vocals and uh i believe the synths are playing in four four and it it makes the song really interesting to uh listen to and it's just it has this really haunting dark uh vibe to it that is just always really really intrigued me so um I, I really love Touch and Go a lot. It's probably one of my favorite car songs and it's got a really great vocal from uh Rick Ocasek. Um, give me some slack, in my opinion, could have been a Devo song. It could have been uh, something that would have fit mm -hmm. on uh, Freedom of Choice or something like that, uh, which which had come out either this year, 1980 or or 1981, something like that. Anyway, it came out at the same time. It's got a great riff from Elliot Easton and a great solo, and it's got great Greg Hawk sense. So I, I really enjoy um, Give Me Some Slack. Um, don't tell me no. Um, I always thought the lyrics were a little silly. Um, but uh, it's got a really good David Robinson pocket and uh, um, some pretty cool uh, LED some guitar flourishes. So overall, not quite as immediate as as the uh, the first three, but um, still a pretty good song. Uh, getting through is a uh, is an up tempo punky uh, guitar or uh, um, car song. Um, really good uh, Benjamin Orr vocal. Um, the only really downside of it is that I wish it could have been longer. I think it only clocks in at like, you know, two and a half minutes. I, you know, I think it could have been, it could have really benefited from being like a minute longer or something like that. Um, Misfit Kid is a really cool uh, mid-tempo song, um, as, as the cars are known for, with uh, some great guitar melt, you know, great guitar and synth flourishes. Mm -hmm. Um, Down Boys, I don't think would sound out of place on uh, the debut. I think, uh, I think it really would have fit would have uh, fit well on the debut because um, I think, in, in if I remember correctly, the debut's running time comes out to be like thirty five minutes or something like that. I think they they could have been if Down Boys were included, it would have been even better than it already is. Um, the great Elliot Easton guitar solo. Um, you wear those eyes is a song I'm not really too much into. Um, I feel like it's a little bit too synth poppy. Um, I, you know, from everything I've read and from everything that I've heard and from my ears, I can, I think that there's probably a drum machine on there and that David Robinson's not really on it. So I don't really know what the story is behind that, but it's pretty, it's a pretty catchy song. Um, overall not not that into it um running to you is a is a good uh is a good song as well again maybe not quite as immediate to me um it's got a good great sense solo by greg hawks and then closing off with up and down um my my big issue with this song is that um it the david robinson snare drum sounds very gated like almost gated, kind of like a uh, maybe not quite to the level that of like Rick Allen's snare on like Pyromania or Hysteria, but I feel like it's just too gated. And I don't know that's that that particular song has always bothered me because of that. But um, you know, it's got you know Elliot's putting in putting in another great guitar guitar performance here. Um, but um, and it's a pretty good way to end the album. Um, Again, not not quite as immediate as some of the other stuff on here, but overall, Panorama I think is a it's not a great Cars album, but it's pretty good. It's <laughs> solid. It's 
you know, you know, the, the first two albums are kind of like very salty potato chips, you know, ridgy potato chips that, you know, the kind of potato chips that, that we like to eat. Uh, Panorama is kind of like a stale potato chip. Like you open up a bag of chips and you leave it out for too long and, you know, you let the air come in and you kind of, it stalizes the potato chip. You can still eat it, but it's not quite as, um, the taste of it is not quite as immediate as like a great crunchy salty potato chip mm -hmm. the way that, that the debut of Candio is. So overall, in my opinion, Panorama is a six out of 10 for that reason. Six out of, what would you, six out of 10. All right. Let me write, get that on here. That's not bad. I don't know, Tate. I thought you were going to rate a little higher, but that's okay. Um, super. Awesome. Thanks for that review. Excellent. See, this is what I like about the Dark Horse episodes. You just never know what people are going to say. And the, some of these records, oh, it's just such a great series. Based on that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt and get his thoughts on Panorama. What's your Thanks. thoughts, Matt? And what I'm just curious, but how, what's your whole, how did you get... Actually, this I'm going to throw this over. It's just us tonight. Tate, before we go to Matt, yeah, how did you get turned on to the cars? Because you're a younger guy, you know. I'm just curious. Well, my uh, my parents uh, played them around the house. I think they had a uh, a greatest hits compilation that they played a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, like like we were talking off air, I was just saying to them that. I think just what I needed is one of the greatest songs of all time. It's probably one of my favorite songs of all time. I I can't tell you how many times I've heard it. And I don't think there hasn't been a time that I've heard just what I needed and it hasn't brought a smile to my face and it hasn't brought tears of joy because I think it's such a well-written song. I think it's probably got Ben Orr's greatest vocal ever on it. And it's just that song and you know there's other great songs in that in that discography too i mean you know there's uh moving in stereo there's good times roll there's my best friend's girl but like for me just what i needed is uh and let's go and candy o and and um it's all i can do and everything like that too i didn't want to forget that but um for me i think that song is what turned me on to the cars yeah I know that song is what, once I realized that how many of a lot of, you know, the big radio hits were on the first, were especially on the first album, uh, you know, made me uh, go and go and buy the vinyl of it. And I listened to it a bunch of times and I, I just never get tired of hearing it. And because I think it's one of the greatest debut albums of all time. So. I can't argue with that. So Matt, how did you get turned on to it? And then you just give us like a brief intro and then you can go on with your, I'm always fascinated how people come into, you know, what happens when you hear these bands and how did they affect you? So Matt, I'm just curious, go ahead. I would like to hear from you. Yeah. So, uh, well, one, I'm from Boston. Oh, okay. Um, and oh, yeah. I was, uh, I was 10 years, I was 10 years old when the debut came out. Mm -hmm. um and so a little bit aware i had some friends who had the album but 79 was really the year that i was getting turned on to music a lot yeah and um my uh sister told my parents that she wanted some albums for christmas and they asked um the older brother of one of my friends who knew new music what should we uh what albums would he recommend that were uh hot and so got um cars candy o uh which had come out that year and uh and then uh, uh breakfast in america super tramp and uh i basically swiped the candio album and uh started listening to it ever since then so uh, cars fan since 79 really i was aware of them before and uh you know you, you were both talking about sort of the expectations going into the third album mm -hmm. with um you know the debut and candio being so well regarded and so popular <laughs> So when Panorama came out, I went into, uh, my parents took me into, so I was 12, and went into uh, Harvard Square to the uh, Harvard Coop in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the week that it came out. And so I bought the, uh, the album then, and there were stacks of the record in the store because it was, you know, the expectation was that this thing's going to really do well. 
And uh, I didn't even have a working turntable at the time. So I grabbed it. I was so excited <laughs> to bring it home. I had to take it to a friend's house even, even to uh, listen to it. So anyways, that, that's sort of my entry into the uh, into the cars. Themselves. Well, you you I have to say something. You mentioned you saw stacks of records. I remember, if you remember this back when you were a kid, when they had cutout bins, you used to see the cars panorama all the time in the cutout bins. Because I think they press too many i don't think well obviously they press too many and then you know some were sent back whatever anyway you tate there was one of those records you used to see all the time with yeah. cutouts in fact i think my copy that i've got on vinyl might be a cutout but it's just funny oh, yeah. it's just it's like going through a time machine but yeah well that's cool though yeah i love it yeah so did, um did you want me to dig yeah. into the album or? hey go ahead take it away Okay, so uh, I guess the the other thing that I would say is just kind of setting up like the the time period for them was that um, Rick Ocasek had just produced uh, Suicide. This is not the album that he produced. This is the first Suicide record, um, and you know they had they had taken out. They had opened for a couple shows uh, on the Candio tour. Suicide had opened up for them, and he was a real champion. So that you know, very avant garde synth confrontational band um and i think that that um permeates some of what you see on uh panorama right so despite these high expectations i think rick okasik was being very art, kind of true to his own art and what he was into and a band he was championing and so that i think um creates some of what maybe some elements of panorama that were contrary to expectations and maybe weren't what people were expecting. Um, you know, uh, Tate, you did a great job going song by song, so I won't, you know, describing each one. I'll just add a couple of points on a few a few of those um, songs from my perspective. When we talked about the opener for uh, Panorama, it is a little interesting in that it's, um, it's long for a car song, right? So it's like five minutes, 40 something seconds, right? So, mm -hmm. and it's uh, got a very steady drum beat throughout it. It's a bit more of a, 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 a slow build that doesn't get to a super big climax. So maybe that also maybe affected folks' opinions when they put it on, doesn't have the immediacy of the uh, of openers on the other two, two records. Um, but as you said, I, I agree, it's a cool song. And, and you know, there was a, a video for it. And uh, Tate, I think you mentioned that Give Me Some Slack could have been a, a Devo um, uh, song. The, uh, the video uh, for Panorama w was uh, produced and directed by the, the Devo. Um, Jerry. Video from, it's, uh, Jerry Cassell. Uh, Jerry, Jerry from, the, from the band. And then um, what's, uh, Chuck Statler uh, produced it. So say, the same kind of brain crew visually for Devo right there with the cars. So it's kind of a, a it's really cool that you uh, observe that. Wow, that's awesome. Um, for uh, for Touch and Go, I, I wanted to just touch on the, touch, oh, sorry, on the uh, guitar solo for mm -hmm. it. Um, so, you know, I think it is part of one of Elliot Easton's highest regarded solos. It's really brilliant. It's really well crafted in the, um, in the the Frozen Fire book, um, there's a little Cars book that came out. I have, the 80s. I've got that. You know? I've got that. Yep. Yeah. Um, so in, in that one, uh, Rick Ocasek talks about how uh, Elliot brought the guitar solo without any music on a cassette, and you know, it was kind of all done. And he said, when we laid it to tape, it sounded great. I was uh, lucky enough to get to take a uh, a guitar seminar with Elliot Easton, and he talked about creating that solo and his experience was a little different than what Rick described in that he said you know he spent so much time crafting the solo and he you know really thought he had something special and when he played it in the studio for the actual recording he said that uh, some of the band members were underwhelmed by it saying that it sounded too thoughtful not as emotional and that it was too crafted and so they, they had him take, do another take. And he said he was angry uh, when he played it. And he says, in his mind, he played it the exact same way that he played it, other than being angry, thought it was just the one. And that he felt like just with the, him looking angry while he played it, that the <laughs> other guys said, oh, yeah, that's it. That's the take. But he said it was, you know, 
just they were basically identical. Uh, so I thought that was a funny story, uh, but just what a what a brilliant example of the way that he really plays the changes for his uh, guitar solos, right? Really thoughtful about the chords that he's playing over, mm -hmm. and not just sort of you know scale oriented um, soloing. It's it's really uh, so well done. Um, for for give me some slack. The only thing that I would add to that is just I think that one of um, the best lyrics that Rick Ocasek has uh, put together. It's a little different. It's uh, subject matter wise, it's it's a portrait of like a tenement building. There's a really a non cars like, and maybe again, not not the uh, good times roll. Although that has a more subversive meaning than what it sounds like, but you know, not as sort of immediate fun sounding subject matter. Uh, but, but it's got some well, vision is intact, and uh, I love the, just the way that the phrasing of this one. So and the peeping key, keyhole introverts with the monkeys on their backs and stuff like that. It's just got these really cool turns of phrases, uh, but with sort of a, a kind of moody, dark portrait. And then you come in with the kind of the classic cars move of sort of these more abstract verses and then a straightforward lyric on the, you know, an, an idiom of some sort of return of phrase for the chorus, right? Just give me some slack. Um, and then uh, I guess the, um, Pointing out maybe the the suicide emphasis uh, or influence on some of the songs. So on uh, getting through, it's got those kind of sound effects, a very synthy type song, and then um, you're getting some of that almost what was the the vocals for suicide very uh, echoey, almost rock and roll, but it's these yelps and screeches and yells, and I mean it's really oh suicide. Suicide's an interesting band. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, um, no doubt. I mean, people say you should, everyone should listen to Frankie Teardrop once and, and a lot only listen to it once, but it's, it's a really emotionally powerful, <laughs> not an easy oh listen. God. Um, and so, but anyways, you're getting, they, they do a little bit throughout both Rick and Ben. So even Ben's getting into it, just these kind of like little streaky Yelp echoey things in there, which is uh, kind of cool. And um so, so you get the kind of Rick's version of that vocally on getting through, and then uh, Ben on the down on uh, down boys. I think that's where he's kind of adopting a little bit of that vocal style. Uh, you know, Tate, you did a great job pointing out where there was those other great Elliot Easton solos. Yeah. Um, I guess the last one on the on the record that I'll point out is uh, for you. Wear those eyes. The the Velvet Underground influence, right? So people often cite Velvet Underground, and you've got the "I'll be your mirror" uh, lyric sort of pointing back to the the Velvet Underground lyrics. So I think um, Rick's kind of paying tribute to uh, another band that he really liked with that song. Um, and then the the uh, there were um, you know there were other another song recorded for the record. So um, and that showed up on the B side. So on both. Uh, Give me some slack and don't tell me no. The B sides had "Don't Go to Pieces" as a B side, and that's a that's a strong song too. And you can, I mean, that's on Spotify and YouTube and stuff now, mm -hmm. uh, so easy enough to hear. But a uh, pretty cool song. Like, sounds like it would have uh, fit in well. You get a little bit of a more prominent Elliot Easton and Greg Hawks uh, backup vocals on that one. So, uh, I guess uh, overall for me. I, uh, Panorama is a very strong album. Uh, I'm giving it a nine. Um, nice. So it, it's, uh, I, I listen to Panorama and Candy O uh, more than any of the other Cars albums. To me, those are mm -hmm. probably my two favorites. I, um, you know, it's uh, the, the, the first album, its greatness gets overshadowed by how ubiquitous the songs are, right? So you do get, you hear them on the radio. So I'm, I, mm -hmm. I'm sure I underrate the, the debut at this point in my life. Um, but, uh, you know, love, 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 Candio and, and uh, Panorama both. So it, it's a nine for me. So that, to leave Candio, room for the 10. And uh, to me, you know, the, the critics said Panorama was like a cold record. And to me, it's not cold, it's cool. I think the it, it sounds uh, really hold up well. Um, I, I take your point, Tate, on the gated uh, uh, snare sound. But overall, you know, I think the guitar tones are great. It, it alternates between sort of old time rock and roll clean electric sounds with uh, more distorted, a lot of neck pickup, really nice tone on some of the uh, other solos. So those sound great. The synth sounds, 
I think are pretty un unique and hold up well, as opposed to later on where you're making synths sound like other instruments. Here, they're just sounding like their own thing. And so I think yeah. those um, hold up better than other things that uh, come using synthesizers later in the, uh, in the 80s overall. And, and I, I think this is my favorite Ben Orr bass tone um, on this album. Um, he had an apartment fire right before the recording of it, and he yeah. lost his bass and his bass pedal. So he was using different equipment um, for this um, for this record than what he had before. Um, so yeah, I think he had a, uh, a precision with like an active uh, pickup on there. And... Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've seen him play that live. Yeah, He's, yeah. He so had like a white. A he had a white. Uh, what were those? It came out like an eighty-one or eighty-two. No, eighty-one, eighty. Uh, they came in candy apple red, Lake Placid blue, and white, and they were had active oh, circuits. You know more than me. I remember. Yeah, yeah. He used it in like a video. That would make sense. Yeah. So he he, uh, he had to completely kind of change what he was doing because of the because of the fire and and, it, and if you listen, it's got kind of a a, a different tone and um, you know, I think his bass parts are are pretty thoughtful, right? He's not a uh, you know a uh, you know, super flashy, but they're, they're right. very, really good parts um, throughout. And uh, I guess the last thing I would just say is that I think it's a brave record because, you know, they didn't go and give people what they wanted. They followed their artistic uh, vision, what they thought was cool. And uh, I really admire that. And I think that's part of the reason maybe why it holds up so well for me. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, not, maybe not quite as brave as like, a, you know, a Tales from Topographic Oceans from Yes. Not that, not that's that. Kind, now right? that's way, that's a different animal. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, I agree 100%. I think Panorama, you know, point, yeah, yeah, that's, it's, it was a brave sp step. Yeah. Yeah. Great point there. That's funny. So a nine, that's great. Well, you know, man, I think you and uh, I could have, you basically said what I was going to say because I was going to bring up the fact that Rick had produced suicide. I think he started production on that in January of 80. And if you ever heard of suicide or Alan Vega's solo material, it's a different, it's a different animal kids. All I'm going to say, and I can hear, I think the panor had he not done the production on the suicide record, I think panorama would have been a different record. I think, I think it's totally influenced by working with that band. Um, you know, not a carbon copy, but you can, I can just feel after listening to that record, I can feel the influences all over it. And it just makes Panorama just a bit more on the edge, but think about it. They had two successful albums. Yeah. They could have continued on the same pattern while well, they kind of did shake it up kind of went backwards probably because of all the records that ended up in the cutout bins of panorama but i look at the the cars candy on panorama kind of as a trilogy i always group those records together because i think that the cars and candy even though they were recorded at different times different studios those records sound identical same kind of songwriting catchy pop hooks great guitar playing i mean think about led as a guitar player one of my favorite guitar players always well thought out he's just not going to go out there and wing something each of his solos are almost like a song within the song what he comes up with fits those songs perfectly to a t he has a beginning and the solo has an end people have also said that about ace freely his solos have a beginning and an end. They're just not someone just doodling and shredding or anything. It's someone who really knows what they're doing and is just, just absolutely brilliant. But he's one of the best guitar players oh, by far. And his tonality, excellent. And you were mentioned in Tate, the whole sound of the band, pretty much everybody's mentioned that. Great keyboard sounds. Ben Orr's bass on Panorama sounding great. Um, the only negative that I heard was maybe that uh, gated drum sound, but you know, it was 1980. We're getting to that point, you know, because by the time you get to heartbeat city, we're all electronic. So enjoy what you got on panorama because it doesn't last too long. Um, but as a record, holy crap, I, I'm like, I'm like Matt. I listen to 
I, I love the debut. I can't put my finger on it. Um, but I tend to listen to Candio and Panorama. I can't, it's, I like that contrast. You know, I like it that they're pushing the, the limits and Panorama and just kind of going, eh, we kind of did the pop thing. Let's experiment a bit more. But I think the songwriting and the arrangements and the uh, sequencing on the record are great. You gentlemen covered the tracks. I don't need to cover that again. But I love Panorama. When I first heard it as a kid, I was kind of taken back because I thought that, you know, the Cars and Candia were such great records that I thought, uh oh, what are we doing? Though I love the song Panorama and Touch and Go at the time. But some of the other stuff, I just couldn't get it. It it It's not one of those records you can just listen to it instantaneously and get it. The more you listen to it, the more rewards there are. Okay. It's one of those records. And some of the best records ever made are those type of records. I must say when I first heard the Beach Boys Pet Sounds, which it's number two on everybody's list, I listened to it and I went, what is what? But man, the more I listen to it, the more I got it. And the same thing goes for Panorama. So it's just one of those records. I put it right up there with Candio and the first album. Um, I would give Candio and the, and the Cars 10. Even though I don't listen to the first album as much, I still love it just as much. I'm going to give this a nine like uh, Matt, because I can't give it a perfect 10. I guess I could, but I'm going to give it a nine because I think it's a brilliant. I think, could I use the word masterpiece? Maybe not. It's just so, this record is just a lot deeper than the other records. You know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to leave it there, gentlemen, and give it a nine. I think it's a great record. So if we calculate it, well, before we calculate, does anyone else have anything else to add? I think it's a good thing Tate was here to uh, keep us fanatics somewhat in check. So that well, you know, to bring, I, me, bring the album, the, the, the score down, people will be. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I love it. I could listen. I could. I will go on record. It's one of those records I can listen to over and over again and never get tired of. In here. Yeah. And yeah. same with Candy. Well, and the first album. I don't know. I just think that Candy was just. Took the first record and just solidified it and perfected it even though i think they're both the same record um but yeah this fits right in it's just a little bit more experimental but the brilliance of the cars is totally here on this record i think um, i just the thing the thing that makes me give it a six is that i i don't know just some of the songs on there just were not grabbing me in the way that in the way that the, the stuff on the first two did and you know like you were just saying i it wasn't meant to so maybe right right you know, maybe i just need to listen to it more and you know i think rate. have you ever heard the suicide album that okasic produced i don't think i have okay i'm gonna need to rectify that. i'm gonna give you an assignment i would go <laughs> okay. listen to that okay and then go back and listen to panorama Okay, and the, the the one that he produced is more accessible than the debut uh, mm -hmm. for for suicide. But they they're both uh, a bit more challenging <laughs> records. Than they, so then you'll, you'll find a good that, word. You'll find Panorama very accessible after you after you listen to to okay. that. Yeah. So the name. What's the name of the suicide album? Um. Oh shoot. Uh, the um. They're both, it's just a, a variation on the name, isn't it? The, uh, yeah, I think so. The second, oh, the shoot. first one's Suicide, and the second one, I think it's almost like It's suicide. the one that came out in 1980, so you'll find oh, out. The one that came like out in 1980, that's yeah. the one I'll then. I can't yeah. think of it at the moment. I wasn't even thinking that I even talk about it, so. The, uh, you, and you can also, uh, there's there's uh, some YouTube clips of them playing, right? So they when they opened for the cars, they were booed tremendously. So it's, talk about brave. I mean, there's like a minute and a half clip. I think it's at the Boston Garden of uh, just the of them on stage and the fans booing and, you know, the the bravery of uh, of suicide. Yeah, I'm going to check that out then. I'll, then brace, I'll... Your, brace yourself, though, Tate. But 
it's worth it kind of puts everything in perspective that's all i'm saying i would just check it yeah. out i'm sure it's on youtube or something you know you can find it all right so we got a six a nine and a nine things are looking good for panorama gentlemen so that gives us an average of eight now i'm looking at the the reviews you know uh all music gave it a well three and a half's not bad Robert Criscow, who we always make jokes, hates everything. He gave the first two albums B pluses, but he gave uh, Panorama B minus. So we might be on there. We're in the ballpark with Criscow, I think, you know. Uh, Encyclopedia Popular Music, I'm not sure what that is, gave it two. Pitchfork gave it an eight out of ten. I think, I think we're right in there. I just think that it's just, I do think it's probably their dark horse record based on what we've rated it i'm going to give it a dark horse i'm going to give it an official stamp that it's <laughs> a certified dark horse album the other album would be a good one to look at in the cars catalog would be doors to door yeah i yeah. mean door to door is one of those records that well they'd also ended up in the cutout bins but it's it's out there see i think panorama fits more in line with traditional cars you know you get to door to door you've got heavy distorted guitar all the time there's not that much of elliot easton ripping off elliot easton like solos on it there's some great tracks on it but that's another record i think someone needs to look at you know my mom uh i forgot to mention my mom i think saw them on that tour for door to door back in what was that 88 she said she saw them right yeah. before the club so um yeah and said that uh what she remembered of them was that they did not move around very much so <laughs> that whole door to door period though for me just seems so i'd like to know more about it i i'd have yeah. to reread that cars book again matt God, I wonder where that book is. It might be in the attic somewhere. I need, I, I need to, I need to listen to Door to Door again. It's been a little. I mean, did they go into Door to Door thinking that, well, this is probably it? One more record. Was that the end of their Electra contract? Yeah. Do you know? Um, I don't know contractually. I do think they probably were knew they were running on uh, fumes. There, you know, they brought back um, songs that have been written pre. Yeah debut album right so Tata and uh, one yeah. other um so you know I think and, and you know Rick had done a lot of you know decent number of solo albums at that point had um more coming right so I think more of the writing may have been going towards other other things and uh I think they felt probably felt that it had run its course it's it's, it's a little it's kind of a long album for them too like it's a yeah. little um yeah, that that would be a good one to talk talk. That about. would be a good one to talk be, about. What about uh, what about on what about a show on like move on move like this or something like that? Yeah, we could do that. That'd you know a, what's funny about that record? There are absolutely no guitar solos on that thing. No, not from what I remember of it. No, I need like I said, I need to go back and listen. What's to up it. with that? You've got Elliot Easton back back. He's back, and there's no guitar solos on it. It's odd. I don't get it. I don't I I don't dislike the record. I need to revisit it. I mean, I bought it when it came out. I listened to it for a week and then I just kind of put it away. It's not like I disliked it. I think I'd like door to door better. Yeah. Um I think I a lot of, like door to door to be honest. Yeah, I think uh I think a lot of sentiment from everything that I've read at the time, a lot of people, you know, listen to it, listen to move like this when it came out and they're like, oh cool a cars album i haven't heard anything from them in a long time and then they're like oh yeah, this is pretty good yeah and then they move on to other things <laughs> i don't know what the story was behind it i'd i need to look into it because there has to be something that's all they did yeah exactly and then they had uh and i was had... hoping hey i was hoping for more so yeah. yeah and then they had the performance uh at the rock and roll hall of fame and i think it was it was great yeah that and, was great and that you know, and I watched it when when it was happening, and then boom, a year later, Rick's gone. Yeah, and yeah, dude, I remember, I remember waking up to find that that Rick when Rick had passed away, and that was uh, that was one that hit me, that hit yeah. me. 
harder than than the rest of them. I don't know, Ben Or that was. Yeah. Do you ever see those videos that they ever did for like the Rhino thing, for the box set? I think, and Ben Or is Ben. Oh, he looks. Oh, I just that just killed me. What was it? What did he pass away? Was it like uh, he had pancreatic cancer? He had cancer. But man, he was thin in that interview. He was, I don't know how long he lasted after that, but I don't think it was very long. But at least they were able to do that final interview. That, you know, that was great. But yeah, I think they got such a, but such a talent. Ben Orr, his voice. And, and, and a great bass player, too. Oh, yeah. They uh, played to the song. No one overplayed in the cars. Yeah. They played to the song, and just like Ellie Easton, perfect solos designed for that song. Yeah, that's what I think. I think that's one of their enduring um, traits. I think. Yeah. One one other recommendation to uh, the uh, there's a great Ben Orr book. Oh, uh, Joe, Joe Milliken, uh, Let's yeah. Go. So uh, really, really well done uh well written well researched um book so i would definitely recommend that you know he and rick had a lot of pre-cars history together oh, yeah. milkweed yeah yeah, yeah. captain swing um, captain swing and they uh and, and you know ben was like a teenage rock idol in uh cleveland so he he was um oh yeah you know, precocious and popular at a very early age so he he, he knew how to as you mentioned, like where he, he looked comfortable on stage. He had a lot of experience before ever doing anything. With yeah, that. there's a lot of pictures online. Like, uh, I think there's a site like Central Ohio Band History or whatever. Oh. But there's a lot of pictures of Ben Orr back in the 60s when he was a kid and all these bands he was in. Hmm. I mean, he was cool. he was a pro and uh, just so much talent. Did you have, I know we're rambling on, but has anybody ever heard the Milkweed album that they, Ben and had you ever heard yeah. that, Matt? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's folk. Um, it's folk, pretty much. Yeah. Nothing like the Cars tape. You never Nothing would have like, guessed. You would never have guessed. Okay, I don't have to go yeah. check that out. Well, I know just... that uh, David Robinson was in. Was it uh, the Modern Lovers? Yeah, yeah. I think before He's on that great first uh, Modern Lovers record. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I need to go back and I need to listen to that one again. I remember that being good. Oh, yeah, it's phenomenal. Oh, it gets That's like a, a that record gets like five star reviews. I mean, it's a it's a classic. Oh, it's yeah. a classic record, you know. Yeah, I need and you to get Jerry that. Harrison the talk, future Talking Heads in the band. Yeah. Too. Oh yeah, I forgot that he was in that band. Yeah. Dang. Greatness, Boston yeah. greatness. <laughs> All right, guys, I guess we can wrap this one up. So we're giving this uh, an average of eight, the Cars Panorama from 1980. I'm going to certify this. I need a stamp or something, a dark horse record. So I want to thank Tate and Matt for coming on tonight. We had a great discussion. Yeah, we went on a bit of a tangent, but, you know, we like having discussions on the show. So, uh, What's next on the Contrarians? God only knows. There's a whole bunch of great content down the line. If you'd like to be on one of these Patreon panels, you can be on one of these too. The link's down below. If you don't want to become a Patreon, you can you can help the channel out by uh, going to Kofi and just buying us a cup of coffee or whatever, making a donation. Also, we also have a T Public site where we have merch. Get yourself a shirt while you're at it so uh without any i don't have much anything else to say gentlemen i guess this was a great discussion and uh i shouldn't say i guess it was a great discussion i love this discussion we could always talk more cars we just blaze the surface tonight tonight so all I'm right tate matt nice to see you guys and you guys have a good one and we'll see you on the next one everybody. <laughs>